God creates, forgives, saves us all, all done close, compassionate, and tender. That's accompanying. Close, compassionate, and tender. Think of God's relationship to you, the creator of all things. God's way is close. He's very close. And of course, compassionate. We're going to look at this. God it pains God. One of the worst things about the sins that I commit is that God is so sorry that I'm hurting myself. It's, you know, a parent would know this when their child hurts himself. You might get angry, but under that is, you know, I wish, I wish you wouldn't do that. You know? And of course, tender. God is tender. He's not tough. He's not tough. In a holy place surrounded by witness to the truth of this, like in this place, like where we are now, each of us finds it no great labor to feel comforted and confident. Alone and suffering, it's different. Harder to feel comforted and content. Remember that God sometimes lets us feel down, scattered down. Why? Well, because there's something in us which needs a little reorganizing. We're not going to pay any attention to it unless we feel down about it. No one needs help understanding what suffering is. Suffering breaks unwanted into our normal comfort, convenience, and control. It comes into our spirits first as physical pain, though this is only the tip of this iceberg. So notice, what is our image of Jesus of Nazareth? In every church, the crucified Christ. So we notice, first of all, his physical pain. That's necessary. It's very necessary for the young. But you and I need to notice that our experience of suffering it is what he went through. So the tip of the iceberg is his physical suffering, but under it is here, look. Though this is only the tip of this iceberg, for under this physical suffering are disappointment, rejection, hatred, violence, being ignored, helplessness, bitter resentment <coughs> and anger, failure, and hundreds of other breaks in our normal comfort, convenience, and control. It's our sufferings that he bore. That's what this is about. It's our sufferings that he bore. There is a huge serpent, I'm reading again, there is a huge serpent of suffering on earth, much of which we already have ways and wealth to alleviate, yet neglect. But we cannot master this experience. We cannot get our minds around it, explain it. Suffering is an absurdity. Somehow a raging wrong inflicted on the beauty of humankind. We cannot find a meaning in it except what Jesus has witnessed to by dying on the cross and rising again. For centuries, Christians have devoutly followed Jesus in these sufferings. We have accepted that the sufferings of the second person of the Holy Trinity belong to his human existence. But we need to deepen our prayer until we can see that there are also the holy sacrament of the triune God's suffering. Jesus is suffering, a sign and symbol pointing to a further truth. God Almighty <coughs> suffers. I want to tell you two things, personally. First, that is not what I was taught. I was taught that God's suffering was only Jesus' human suffering. 
God didn't suffer. It was his humanity that suffered. Thomas Aquinas thought that. It's not, this is not a simple problem. Let me tell you that. It's not a simple problem. But that was not, I mean, we dropped bombs on cities. You know, I grew up during the Second World War. I mean, I, I matured during the Second World War. I can still remember the first time I ever saw a dead American soldier. It was a famous picture of Iwo Jima, a Marine half buried in the sand, face down, dead. It was a traumatic experience for me. So that's the first thing I wanted to tell you. I have had to make a tremendous change in my understanding. And when I first began to think, Jesus is humanity, was the person of the Holy Trinity. The second person of the Holy Trinity suffered. But the persons of the Holy Trinity accompany one another always. Everything they have, they share. Of course he shared his suffering. Of course he did. I was terrified. I was terrified. I was afraid of that. I was afraid of that. But now, a man whom I helped decide to be a deacon down in Louisiana was ordained and he wanted to thank me so he sent me a little crucifix. It's a beautiful little piece of work. Jesus is on the cross. Behind him is the Father holding him up. And above them is the Holy Spirit. We're beginning, we're beginning to understand that Jesus' human suffering is a sign and symbol, a sacrament, pointing to the suffering of Almighty God for those whom he loves and whose love he wants, many of whom won't give it to him. So, let's go on. Some good and brilliant thinkers have kept the people of God from having to confront and absorb this into head, heart, and hands. I read an article written just 15 years ago proving that the Father and the Spirit don't suffer. Yet the books of Revelation are full of God's suffering, rejection, grieving humanity's evil, being ignored, his name being used as a commonplace. God, I can't hear it, it's a genie thing. A commonplace, that's his name. His beloved creatures destroying themselves. God help us, what's going on in Ukraine? And, you know, many other nations are preparing a weapon so they can kill each other. It's going on. Disappointment. Outrage. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? What have I done to you? That's Jeremiah, who are frustrated and blaspheming. For a thousand years now, I've already told you this, so let's skip it until the last line. It just won't do. What one divine person experiences, all experience each in a triune, unique way, but they all experience it. <coughs> experience is the key. It's not an idea. I'm not talking about an idea of suffering. It's not an image. I'm not talking about an image of suffering. I'm talking about the experience of suffering. If one person of the Blessed Trinity has an experience, that person shares it with the other person. All three persons are involved in creation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was all things came to be through the Word, and the Spirit of God blew it. All three persons are created. And all three persons are redeemed by sharing our sufferings. 
It certainly won't do now. After two murderous wars, two bombs that obliterated whole cities, two sides that pile weapons while their people hunger and fight disease, after the past century, we can no longer imagine that God is so far apart from the creatures he is continually creating. God watching, creating, the triune God was at Auschwitz, creating them, creating the soldiers, creating the pain, creating the instruments, and is in Ukraine right now and buried in the rubble of an earthquake in Syria. They had another one. He is with wretched refugees everywhere, refused help, drowning in the sea with their children. Faced with living pictures of these horrors, we can no longer imagine that God is comfortably apart from this one experience in his creating suffering. We can no longer imagine that. Now, sit for a minute, sit for a minute, and see how you imagine the almighty creator of all things, the all holy redeemer, right now, suffering because of what we're doing. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Jesus definitively showed us. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. <clears throat> To be in sin does not mean that Jesus incurred guilt. It means that Jesus, divine person that he is, bore what sin inflicts, suffering and death. This is how he died for our sin. We brought suffering and death into the world. He obediently submitted to our suffering. This is also how we are to suffer and die. Never think, never think that your sin is the reason that you're suffering. I'm not making that up. Jesus said, you are not your own judge. You're not your own judge. What you can say is that sin among us, sin among us is what makes us suffer. Sin among us, the evil, the evil despots, the greedy people, the people who are ravishing others, the rapists, the violent, those are the people. That violence, that sin among us is what makes us suffer. But never think that you're, you can't go from my sin to suffering. You can go from the fact of suffering to the being sin. That's right. But not the other way. Never think that. You see, if you think that, you're taking God's place. God is your judge. God is your judge. And he is compassionate and tender and gentle. So get off it. What is my suffering? Look at what it says. 
This is how he died for our sin. He obediently submitted to our suffering. This is also how we are to suffer and to die. We carry the cross that our Creator creates in us and with us because of humankind sin. Sharing that, what that entails, our suffering. We do not share Jesus' suffering. Jesus' suffering is 2,000 years ago. It's over. He's in glory now. We don't share his suffering. He shares our suffering. Understand. And, and we have the means to stop a lot of this suffering and we don't do it, which is our greatest sin. Our greatest sin is what we do not do. It's what we do not do. There are some sins that we do that are pretty big, let me tell you, right? All right? I don't give you the denial. But our greatest judgment is what we don't do. We carry the cross that our Creator creates in us and with us because of humankind's sin, sharing what that entails, our suffering. He shares it with us. Jesus said what each and all of us followers will do. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. The irremediable reality here is take up their cross. We do not share Jesus' cross, as I said, which is long in the past. We are assured suffering today by the realities of human self-destructive behavior. All of this, Master Ignatius would have us consider during spiritual exercises. Sin in the world, there's sin in the world, it's there when I'm born, it's in my parents, it's in my grandparents, sin in the world becomes sin in me. How? By the language I learn, by the ideas I pick up. As I, I don't have any ideas, it's my parents and my teachers and my friends who give me ideas. We, my language is mine, but it's also ours. And in it is all kinds of wrongness, sinfulness. Think of the bad things that you can say in English. So, sin in the world becomes sin in me, and then it becomes my sin. It becomes my sin. But because we are obedient to faith, and, be hope, and because we hope, even when we are being annihilated, we are saved from death by our Redeemer, raised out of it as he was raised. Because remember, Jesus learned obedience through suffering, and he died. But the letter says that he was answered. Well, how was he answered? Well, he was answered this way. On Friday, he was crucified. Died. He had no blood left in him. He was absolutely dead. On Saturday, they kept repose because God rests on Sabbath, so they all rested. They were faithful to that. Then on Sunday, the first day of the new week, Jesus comes into our flesh again, the same flesh. I love the thought that my body is made of stardust, right? Because stars went kaboom together, there was all this dust, and all of a sudden, this is so terrible. Wow, <laughs> Jesus' body is made of stardust. I don't mean the body he had, I mean the body he has. The body he has there is a human heart beating on the throne of God it's going to happen to us it's going to happen to us we are saved from death how well Ash Wednesday tells you perfectly the, the old Latin was uh, 
ashes to ashes. Remember, man, that thou art dust, and to dust you will return. Okay, I'll remember that. But let me tell you something. There's something in the middle that you're leaving out. I'm dust. You're right about that. And I'm going to die, and I'll be dust again. But you know what's in the middle? I'll be alive again. And it's the same dust. <laughs> the same dust. Jesus has his body here. Do you have any fish to eat? Do you have any fish to eat? It's his, his body. That's how he was answered. And he began an age of humankind which is the second half of all creation. And we're in it. We're in it. I'm sorry to tell you this, folks, but you're going to live forever. <laughs> you better get used to it. You better get used to it. You better develop some good qualities, right? Otherwise, I don't want to be around you. <laughs> Again, I'm reading. Finally. Pondering this day by day, we learn to live this magnanimous, disciplined asceticism of love of God and of neighbor and of self. Magnanimous, disciplined asceticism. What is an asceticism? An asceticism is a set of practices that you follow so that you can interiorize the beliefs of a system of spirituality. That's what an asceticism is. Do you do an asceticism? Well, I hope so. I hope so. You know, our asceticism used to be much more detailed than it is now. It used to be that we had fish on Friday, whether we liked it or not. You, there, there was some little creature. You could have crabs and crawdads, right? And then um, we didn't eat meat on Friday. Then we fasted certain days of the week. And then in Lent, we did this, that, and the other thing. We gave up. Once you give up for Lent, you know, it was a big thing. What did you give up this year? Well, chocolate. Oh, you did that last year. <laughs> yeah, it didn't, it didn't work that either, right? <laughs> so what's the discipline now? The discipline now, my sisters and brothers, is keeping your heart calm, keeping your faith and your hope very firm, and really loving those whom God puts into your life to love. Whatever it costs, whatever it costs. And beyond that, I hope you found this out in the triads. Beyond that, Jesus said, listen, you've heard it say that you're going to hate your enemies. No, 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 I'm telling you, no. Pray for your enemies. Do good for those who hurt you. So what about Putin? What about Xi Jinping? What do you think of them? What about certain politicos in this country whom I will not name? <laughs> I don't mind getting in trouble, but that's too far. Right? What about them? What is my attitude toward them? Actually, you know, I think if enough of us prayed that God's spirit would move in Putin and change his heart, it could happen. It could happen. What do you think the Pope's prayer crusade is about? That's what it's about. The prayer of an upright person is powerful. Do I believe that? Although I'm an upright person, I mean as upright as I can be. Do I know I have trouble believing that? But I do it. I do it. I was asked one time by a, well, this was a non-believer while I was in graduate school. Do you pray to the Blessed Mother? To, to, Mary, the mother of Jesus? I said, yeah. Said, you do? I said, yeah. She's still his mother, you know. <laughs> Let's stop it. <laughs> Pondering this day by day, we learn to live this disciplined asceticism of love of God and neighbor and self to the greater glory of God. So Paul said, it is no longer I that live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Can we do one more chaos? <laughs> About the next good thing. We live as God does, accompanying others. And we accompany them as we know God accompanies. Close, compassionate, and tender. Now ponder again 
who all are they? 